Uh, well, it was really a pleasure to be able to kick this event off. Uh, it's truly an honor to be able to introduce our keynote speaker tonight, uh, this afternoon, uh, Ralph Monroe. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I promise not to cry. <laughs> Back when the penny was made of steel, due to, the, due, to the, uh, and due to the need for copper to support the war effort, uh, Ralph Monroe has uh, has gone on to uh, be elected our 13th Secretary of State, uh, which a position is held for five terms. He was uh, a Republican who really knew how to work across the lines, and uh, for this we are forever grateful for such an example that. We have to remind ourselves of. In a term, at a time when uh, the term politician is a dirty word, Ralph remains one of our most beloved politicians ever. But it was in 1976 when this uh, Republican governor was out on a sailboat with his now deceased wife Karen near their house in Bud Inlet that they observed firsthand the, the last killer whale capture in Puget Sound. Due to their advocacy and <laughs> stalwart ness, he was then a, uh, a, a, an aide to then uh, Republican Governor Ann Evans. And due to their collective advocacy, uh, SeaWorld was not able to collect those whales, and Puget Sound has remained a sanctuary for the whales ever since. <laughs> His ability to, walk, to work across the lines really embodies what uh, so all social carnivores are, can teach us, uh, that when we work together in unity, there is strength. Please join me in welcoming our 13th uh, Secretary of State, Mike So it's an honor to be here. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to come here and speak and uh, support Ken and support this whole uh, program. So I want to tell you about uh, a church about this size. It was a Sunday morning and everybody was gathered together. And, uh, minister had not yet spoken. And the organist was playing Abide by Me. And but he was content saying their prayers and in the front doors sprung open and this monster came running in. He said, I'm the devil, get out of here. I'm the devil, go. And people were frightened and scared and he just looked terrible and people jumped up and started to run out of the church and they ran for their lives and screaming and yelling. And finally, uh, the devil was screaming and running around Finally, there was just one elderly man sitting there. The devil ran up to him and said, I'm the devil, don't you know who I am? Why aren't you afraid of me? And the old guy said, well, I've been married to your sister for 22 years. <laughs> so when you get to my stage in life, you start thinking about things that have happened over the years and uh, things that have interwoven through your lives and things that have it changed your life and made it a, a different sort of sort of thing. And in many ways, that's my story with Wales. And I think that uh, I have to give you a little history to tell you and get to what my real point is about Ken and about the center. And so I want you to know that I was raised on the beach down in Bainbridge Island, uh, west side of the island. 1940s, born in the middle of the war. And about 19, I think my first uh, occasion with whales was about 1951 or 52. And my dad woke me up one night and he said, uh, Ralph, come on, the whales are in the cove. And right in our front of our house there was a little kind of cove there. And there was a small pot of whales that were just laying in there breathing. And, um, I think they were rubbing their bellies on the beach. And, uh, I, I don't really know what else they were doing, but just uh, resting like. And I never forgot that. I just always somehow that was indented in my mind. 
And then as you become a teenager and you're growing up and you're a rough, tough guy and everybody's got guns and everybody shoots everything that's uh, shootable. And the state of Washington paid us $8 for every nose of a seal or sea lion that we sent in. I don't know who opened those boxes at Olympia, but I hope they paid them well. It must have stunk. And uh, we were urged, shoot whales, shoot seals. We'll pay you to do it. And uh, like the uh, previous speaker said, there was a mountain, not on killer whales, but on everything else. And uh, we were, uh, we lived in that kind of society, every fish boat, had a rifle in the, in the wheelhouse. Every house along the beach had a rifle. And um, I thought I'd just read a little bit from history for you. Just read. Marine land of the Pacific, south of Los Angeles, discovers a single orca feeding alone in the Newport Harbor. They corral the female whale while hosting it onto a flat, hosted, hoisted onto a flatbed truck. When the whale is introduced to the tank, she smashes head on into the wall. Mm -hmm. Frank Percato, Marineland's head animal collector, recalls, we'd suspected the animal was in trouble because of its erratic behavior in the harbor. But the next day, she went crazy. She started swimming at high speed around the tank, striking her body repeatedly. Finally, she convulsed and died. The autopsy reveals she suffered from acute gastroditis and pneumonia. I didn't pronounce that right, did I? Yes, <laughs> yeah, I had a belly ache. 1962, Frank Mercado, Marine Land's head animal collector, and his assistant, Boots Calandrino, bring their 40 foot collecting boat, the Geronimo, to Puget Sound, in search of another killer whale for their aquarium. After a month of searching, they found a mature male and female orca in Harrow Strait. Must be here. The female, who seemed to be chasing something, headed straight for the boat. At that moment, Mercado saw a harbor porpoise cross the bow and skirt the ship. The porpoise was followed by a female orca in hot pursuit. The two animals circled the boat, the little porpoise apparently using the boat as a shield. Quote, I reeled, and there was a good chance to use the lasso, said Mercado. So I put my partner out on the bowsprit and told him to watch for that porpoise because the orca might be right behind it, and it was. <coughs> he slipped the lasso over the porpoise, and we had it. But then everything started to go wrong. I bet it did. <laughs> she cut deep and sharply and dived under the boat. Its the last few turns caught the heavy nylon line and wound it around the propeller shaft, immobilizing the boat. <laughs> the female ran at the end of the 250-foot-long tether and surfaced at the edge of the mist. Then Mercado heard a screamingly loud, pitching, piercing noise and coming from the female. The big male appeared out of the mist a few minutes later, and together the two animals started swimming, charging, speeding at the boat. They charged several times, turning away only at the last instant, but thumping the boat with a sound flack of flukes as they passed. Mercado grabbed his 375 Magnum rifle and started shooting. He put one bullet in the male, and the male disappeared, but it took ten shots to kill the female. That night, Mercado told the carcass to nearby Bellingham to have the animal weighed and measured. Mercado took the teeth as souvenirs, and the animal was rendered for dog food. I was attending Western Washington University by that time, and in 1964, I was a junior or something, um, Moby Dahl was harpooned up in British Columbia, and they realized the animal hadn't died. They killed her to try to make a sculpture, look at her closely to make a sculpture. And so they put her on display. She lived for three months. And in 1966, uh, Namu was captured up at Namu, British Columbia. And uh, Ted Griffith flew up there, $8,000 cash, and bought the whale and built a pen, put the whale in the pen, and we were going to Western over here in Bellingham, and uh, it was front page news in all the papers, all over the world, not just here, but all over. And uh, so we went to see the whale going to the Deception Pass Bridge. And I'm only telling you this story to have you realize 
how excited people were. There were 10,000 people on the bridge and in the surrounding hills right on the both sides to watch that whale go through with, with the tide. 10,000 people. Seattle Marine Aquarium was a, was a home zoo. It wasn't the aquarium that's here today. It was some floats in the water out in front of up here 50, 52 or 53, somewhere along there. People were fascinated. Uh, the, the Seattle Civic leaders, uh, not knowing what to do with the World's Fairgrounds up by the Space Needle, said, let's build a big aquarium up there and put the whale up there. And only Emmett Watson, who was a columnist, and kind of the, he had an organization called Lesser Seattle, not Greater Seattle, <laughs> for the Seattle PI. And he said, what if the whale dies? What are you going to do then? And that, uh, that winter, um, Ted Griffith took the whale over to Waterman on the, on the Bremerton side, but right across from us on Bainbridge Island. My dad fished there practically every day that the weather was good. He had a little rowboat and he fished along the beach for cutthroat trout. And uh, Griffith had the whale in the, in the pen there, in a pinned off cove. And uh, my dad wrote me a letter, and I can't find the letter, and I'm looking for it. Uh, he wrote me a letter, he said, that man is in the water with the whale. And we couldn't even comprehend that. I mean, that would be like dropping into a pit full of rattlesnakes or dropping into a lion's den. We couldn't even imagine that. And, um, but Griffith learned that you could teach these animals to do tricks, and you could swim with them, and you could ride them all those kind of things. And after that, um, Griffith and Don Goldsbury from this island went crazy. Um, everybody wanted a whale. The aquarium <coughs> industry started to pump out their version of science. Uh, quote, there are thousands of killer whales. We couldn't possibly deplete the population. Quote, whales no longer in captivity. Quote, uh, whales are safer in captivity. Quote, perhaps the only way to save this species is through captivity and selective breeding. And the federal government began to fund these studies where they would, the marine circus parks would go to renowned uh, intellectual people at major <coughs> universities and get them to write a paper to prove that these things were true. And all I can say is that the bullshit got deeper and deeper. <laughs> and then in 1970, uh, we had the capture of Ted Cole. And I wasn't involved in that. I didn't even know about that until a few months after it had really happened, except what I watched on television. But those of you that weren't, around here were involved in that. It was a, a captor saw a super pod off Penn Cove and shoved the whole, whole group of whales, 60 plus whales, into Penn Cove. There was an observer from the state of Washington contracted the federal government to, to make sure they played by the rules. And they took the observer uh, out to dinner, and I think there was plenty more than dinner at that dinner as far as uh, how long the evening went on. And, in fact, by the time they got back, the observer had no idea that they had killed six whales, six whales, drowned them, accidentally tried to sort out whales, and had wrapped their bodies in anchor chains and um, took them over to an adjoining the deep water area and sunk them. Now, I always think that God is a little bit on our side in this whole battle because a couple of nights later a drag boat came along, a fishing boat, and caught those whales in anchor chains in his nets. And uh, he was angry and he drug them up on the beach and dumped them and left them on the beach. Now the beach he dumped them on was the neighbor of Eric Nalder who was a reporter for the Seattle PI, Seattle newspaper. And that became a pretty good story, front page story. But really, if you went out and surveyed the public, nobody really cared. Um, it was like we were capturing rattlesnakes or 
something else. Uh, there wasn't that public support. You, you couldn't have even dreamed of having this many people gather together anywhere in support of this. In 1976, my wife, by the way, Fred, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll respect Bill. He's not deceased. <laughs> She's divorced. <laughs> my wife and I are divorced, and we're really good friends. And we laugh about this. That's okay, Fred, you're going to take the blame for that one. <laughs> my wife, Karen. Former wife Karen is a wonderful person. She's very involved in this effort. And we're very good friends now. And, and uh, my wife today is a wonderful lady who's been very supportive of this effort as well. So I feel blessed. My former wife Karen and I were sailing with a group of friends in Olympia Harbor. And uh, we were had no idea there's any whale captures going on. And, we were witness from about 50 yards away of, of a capture operation. Um, the permits uh, were read that these whales should be allowed to swim into a cove or a bay, and they would to be, uh, I don't remember the word was peacefully, maybe Sandra remembers, but it was, they were to be not harassed anyway, and uh, netted in the bay. And in fact, uh, they uh, had chased these whales all the way 30-some miles from the Tacoma Narrows Bridge uh, down through the Puget Sound uh, with uh, chase boats and then an airplane using explosives. And, you know, some people call these explosives firecrackers, other people call them seal bombs and uh, so forth, but if you don't think they're powerful, put your ear under the water sometime and drop one in beside you and imagine if you were a sonar-operated uh, creature. And they drove the whales uh, down into the to the shallowest water. The water where we were sailing was only about 25 feet deep. And uh, there was no place for the whales to go. And when they turned to make a run for it, uh, they were they were captured. And it was one of the most gruesome things that I've ever experienced. Uh, and all of our friends that were with us, and all uh, even people on the shoreline, talked about the screaming they could hear between the animals as uh, the siblings were separated. and. Uh, the pot was divided up and so forth. Some were inside the net, some were outside the net. And if you've never seen what they call a capture operation, let me tell you how they close the net. Uh, there's two open torches on the back of the boat. And uh, there's a guy standing there, and he's lighting these explosives as fast as he can drop them. So it's not like an explosive and then another five minutes. It's like boom, boom, boom. And it drives the whales into the net, and that's how they made their capture. Uh, they assured us, shouting back and forth, that they had permits, everything was legal. We were so disgusted and so disturbed that we went ashore, and I can tell you that agencies don't answer the phone on Sunday night. <laughs> and uh, there was virtually nobody we could call. And these whales were in the net, uh, and they were consolidating the net with the second net. And we didn't know what to do. We were a young couple. Uh, I was an assistant to the governor. I was a flunky. I was uh, on the staff. Um, I was not a high-level position. And we just didn't know what to do. But we were convinced that this was wrong and something should change. And so our, as a last resort, we called at home. There were no cell phones in those days. A reporter named Mike Layton from the Seattle Post. And uh, he took our call. He was not happy to take our call because uh, he had been visiting with his mother and doing family stuff. But he said he'd go take a look. And uh, he didn't say he'd write a story or anything. But uh, next morning, uh, my wife and I tossed, tossed and turned all night. We were upset about this. And next morning, about 4.45, I heard the PI delivery guy go by our place, our farm. And, I went out, walked up to the paper box, got the newspaper, and there it was, a big bold headline. Six whales captured in Olympia Harbor, and on and on and on. And I called uh, the Attorney General, who was a friend of mine, Slade Gordon, later became 
United States Senate member, and I said to Slade, I said, I'm really disgusted by this. And he said, I'm disgusted too. He said, this is wrong. And uh, he said, you go to work, over to my office at 11 o'clock, I'll have a staff group waiting for you. And I went over to the office at 11 o'clock, and these guys, I do them all, men and women, and they started teasing me. Oh, Monroe, now we're going to save the whales. Yeah, right. They weren't enthused whatsoever because we had to sue our own game department to get to the federal agencies to get to zero. And it wasn't a pleasant thing to sue your own government. But the one thing they did to me is they walked up to me, the lead assistant attorney general, and grabbed me by the throat and said, Ralph, I need some credible witnesses. I need some whale experts. And you've got to deliver them soon because we're going to go into court tomorrow. <laughs> and let me tell you, this is, this is the gist of my story. There were no experts. There were no experts. We had a little symposium going on about killer whales right at the same time at Evergreen State College. And they led me, that led me to Paul Spong, Dr. Paul Spong, on the third day. And Paul is a wonderful, wonderful friend of mine. But putting Paul on the witness stand in, a, in the U.S. District, in the first in state court, in the U.S. District Court, wasn't easy in 1976. His hair was down to here. He talked about playing the flute, and the whales would surround him out in the water. <laughs> <laughs> and I could see. The judge wasn't going to buy this. <laughs> but Paul was good. Don't misinterpret. I'm not putting him down. But that was all the kind of science we had then. And it was amazing that the fact that a guy could sit in a kayak and have the whales surround him and, and listen to him play the flute. That, you know, that was something that we couldn't believe either. And so when, they, when, the, when we got into federal court, in the trial, the judge caught see we were lying so many times uh, that we ended up to start to make some progress in the case. And um, I want to tell you, we had very few friends. Uh, George Will wrote a national full-page column, Newsweek magazine, about what a bad guy I was. And uh, just uh, the mayor of Olympia openly criticized me. He said, you're wasting your time. You're screwing around with something you shouldn't be bothered with. All kinds of things like that. We were in state and federal court for 10 days. People in Olympia started to rally in our support. A lady called me one night. She said, you know, they rented a truck today. And I said, who are you? And she said, I won't tell you, but I work for the truck company. They got a truck. That means they're going to try to take the wheels out of the state. They're going to try to load them at the Boston Harbor boat ramp, take them out in the middle of the night. So we had to get papers, serve papers, restraining orders on them. The judge told us when we got the restraining order, you need a bond. Did you ever try to get a bond on a whale? <laughs> it ain't easy. If you don't know somebody, nobody's going to give it. Finally, uh, the judge said we could talk about Penn Cove. Uh, SeaWorld didn't want to talk about Penn Cove. Not at all. And uh, so we said, well, we'll settle with you if you'll leave the state. You let the whales go free. They, they went to the University of Washington for eight days or something to get these radio monitors hooked to them, which lasted about a week. But and uh, we called the Attorney General of Olympia Slate Court, and we said, "Could you come up? We're going to probably settle this afternoon." And his staff had done a fabulous job. He came up, and we were met in the hallway of the federal courthouse, and uh, we said, "Number one." You leave the state. Number two, the whales go free. And Slate spoke up and he said, oh no, there's one more provision. And that is that you will never, ever seek permits to take or capture whales in Washington Water. Wow. And SeaWorld said, we'll never sign that. And we said, okay, let's go back into court and talk about that. Um, that's when they said they knew they had to sign off and they agreed. 
But we left that court as victors. Uh, we locked out. I have to tell you a little side story. Don't misinterpret this as well. There were about 100 people in front of the courtroom protesting. And there were some pretty weird looking people in that group. <laughs> and my wife said, Honey, who are those people? I said, hey, They're on our side. <laughs> Don't worry about it, they're all good people. <laughs> we walked out of that courtroom, we needed two things. We needed one place to watch whales in the wild. And uh, that became critically important. We weren't going to succumb to the argument that the only place you could watch whales was in an aquarium in a swimming pool. We weren't going to buy that. And uh, a few years later, the Reagan administration agreed to give us lime kiln for a buck. And we've been, since that time, we've been locating other locations. But um, it's, that was one thing. And the second thing is, uh, we needed science. We desperately needed science. And somebody told me about Ken Bell, and um, I, I had never heard of him, I didn't know him, and I came up to San Juan Island, and uh, I will tell you that when I went in his basement, I said to myself, this is our guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is our guy. Uh, he could be, and he was, a credible witness. He could argue and debate and convince the Navy Admiral that the Navy was wrong. How many admirals have I had at your house? <laughs> four or five, yeah. four or five over the years. He could speak to five people or 500 people and offer a convincing argument. He could testify in a courthouse or at the state house or at the United States Congress. He had credibility. And um, that's the value of this man, that's the value of this center, and that's the value of this event. Uh, you, whether you want to believe it or not, have become the world's experts on killer whales. And the world is relying on all of us to tell the truth and to talk about the future and to offer the alternatives for change that are so necessary. You're all part of this. It may be have been going on for 40 years, 50 years, or whatever, but this battle isn't won yet. And um, I think it's very important for me to say to you, uh, we can't stop now, we can't stop here, and in fact, in many ways, this is just the beginning of what we need to accomplish and do. So I urge you to be supportive, to build on this event, to put out some real money for these items that are offered for auction, uh, to be involved, and this is defining our state. It's defined, it's already defined this island and this county but it's defining our state in, in so many ways. Somebody asked Ken one time, if you could change one thing in the world, what would it be? And he said, well, I would change the notion that man is against nature to that man is part of nature. And I think that in many ways, uh, Ken has taught us that, and the center has taught us that. Not just Ken, but all the people that have been involved. And before, before I close, I want to just mention some other people because uh, that are or not or cooperate or are or connected or uh, have, have been with us for a long and I, and I apologize if I miss somebody because there's a lot of people. But uh, Susan Berta, where are you? Where is Susan? Susan, stand up.
Holland, Master David Lee. David was here. David was here. Stand up, David. David used to drive the Corky bus, and in the south part of the state, he parked it in our house. Our neighbors would call, who is that guy with that damn bus? <laughs> well, what color is it painted? Bright, uh, bright turquoise or something? Blue. Well, it's a bad kind of blue. But anyway. <laughs> Aaron Cora, where's Aaron? I'm still. <laughs> Sandra, stand up, Sandra. Your book has been very helpful. <laughs> So uh, that's my story. I got a little presentation. Ken, come on up here. I got something for you. Oh. <laughs> uh, there's an amazing lady named Charlene Christ who is a tribal council member in the Spox Island tribe. And this is one of her prints. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. 